Okay, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you all to this second in our, our series of seminars this term. My name is Jeff McDonald. I'm a professor in SENS and also the associate director for the Global Institute for Water Security. And I'd like to thank you all for, for coming. I'd also like to thank Howard Weeder and the Global Institute for uh, funding this seminar series and bringing uh, John Selker to us, uh, to us today. I'd also like to welcome those who are watching via simulcast from the University of Manitoba, um, Cal University of Calgary, uh, University of Alberta, and um, two UBC schools at Kelowna and in Vancouver. So it's a, it's a delight to have everyone here. So today's speaker is John Selker, uh, a colleague and friend from Oregon State University. John's been a professor in the Department of Biological and Ecological Engineering for the past uh, 22 years or so, I think, following his uh, graduate work at Cornell in ag engineering and a bachelor's degree in physics from Reed College in, in Portland. Uh, John has really been a, a pioneer in instrument development uh, as it relates to uh, maybe soil physics early in his career, but it's blossomed into a, a quite a wide range of applications from groundwater hydrology, glacial flow, micrometeorology, and the list is, is quite long. Uh, John has had a number of distinctions in his career uh, his service to the community has really been exemplary. He's been uh, editor of Water Resources Research, our, our top journal in the water resources field, until uh, just, I think, a few months ago. He's had a four-year stint serving as editor. Uh, John has also played a big role in Kawashi, this consortium of universities linked to hydrology, serving on the board of directors and uh, directing the National Hydrology uh, Instrument Facility, uh, sponsored by NSF and linked to Kawashi. And now he's co-director of the Center for Transformational, or Transformative, sorry, Environmental uh, Monitoring Programs. And you'll probably hear a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, John's accolades are, are quite far and wide. This year he was uh, made a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and he's the 2013 National Groundwater Association Jim Hine Award recipient for science and technology. So it's a terrific pleasure to have John uh, with us today, and he's going to talk about some uh, new uh, elements of discovery in relation to uh, measurements of hydrologic systems. John. <coughs> well, thanks very much, Jeff. And uh, I really can't say enough about what an honor this is to be here. Uh, Jeff has put together a phenomenal, Jeff and the whole team have put together a phenomenal group of speakers apart from present company. And, uh, and it's an honor to be among the, uh, uh, the people represented. As Jeff points out, uh, any word over three letters long may be misspelled, so uh, I'm sure the Saskatchewanese here um, can uh, find the error on this page. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, my experience uh, in scientific discovery and trying to really speak primarily to uh, people early in their career about that sensation of, of what it is to, to be involved in the process of discovery about earth science systems. And so um, that's really uh, the goal here. Uh, this work um, involves a great number of people's efforts. And so when I say my work, that means my graduate students uh, and et cetera. So you know, uh, really, this represents a lot of contribu contributions from across the world. And I, I, I uh, too many to name, but, uh, but uh, really a fantastic group of people who've made this really possible. Um, and so I, I want to demystify the scientific process. I think there's a, a fair bit of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, poorly understood uh, features to scientific discovery, thinking uh, generally with the notion that it's overly organized compared to what really happens. Um, I also, of course, want to share some of the, my team's work, which is the stuff that gets me all excited. Um, and I want to imbue with you the idea that opportunity abounds that uh, in hydrology, uh, though it's not an absolutely young field, uh, we know less than we, uh, than we don't know. The, the amount of opportunity to better understand hydrologic systems is phenomenal. And so I want to leave you with that. And then uh, making friends, that's been a wonderful uh, period here. Thank you, Jeff, for that. So, uh, you know, who is this guy behind the curtain when it comes time to, to do science, you know? Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, is it this 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 hypothesis-driven person who says, you know, today, you know, in science, there was published this thing where they had a hypothesis and they came up with a solution. And I guess um, my feeling is the actual process 
is, it's particularly neurosciences, is that we go in with a set of ideas that stimulate us, a set of ideas that, that we believe have merit. But then generally speaking, the Earth is a complex system which rewards us with insights we would have never dreamt of. And so the results of our efforts are often far beyond, different to, and distinct from what we may have initially entered the system with thinking about. And that, I think, really rewards, if you look at people who have made progress in uh, this field, it's the hard workers. Why is it the hard workers? It's just those are the ones who kept on pushing. Having a good hypothesis and having it disproven is, is a daily event. Um, but pushing through those, those uh, failures and then seeing the insights that the failures revealed is really where it's all about. Um, now, as I pointed out on that earlier slide, great discoveries have to do with a lot of hard work, but also were often associated with new measurements, new insights. If you look at you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, it had to do with the recent measurements that showed the ether didn't happen. It showed the whole ether model was wrong. And Einstein put it together and said, I believe those experiments. Therefore, if you read, I mean, how many of you have read Einstein's work on this? It's so simple, his little book on relativity. You can't read it. You can, you, once you read it, you say, you just take two facts. It leads you right to relativity. And so really, it's a matter of believing the data and having the data that show new things. And so uh, measurement is really um, a key feature of discovery, particularly in, in natural systems. Now. It, it also, preparation, uh, Louis Pasteur uh, is quoted to have said that uh, luck favors the prepared mind. That is not actually what he said. What he actually said was without a prepared mind, you never will be lucky. He made no guarantees about the preparation actually paying off. So, um, but I think uh, Ignacio Rodriguez de Turbe's uh, point is very well taken in the same context. Is that, you know, he, his, if just always be prepared with three good questions in case God walks in the door. And the point being, you should always be synthesizing that which you know to identify that which you don't know so that you know when you bump into something that addresses those questions. And so really, you should be always reprocessing the, the, your observations and the, and the literature to say, ah, what don't we know still? My brother Harry, uh, who is a, a, a medical science uh, uh, researcher, uh, he says he, he has three simple criteria, very, very humble. One is only work on problems that will change the world. Uh, two, only work on problems that you are uniquely suited to address. And three, have fun. And I talked to my, uh, my thesis advisor, Eve Parlange, and he says, no, only the third one really matters. And, uh, and the point is, you know, gee, have fun. It seems so self-serving. But one of the things that we recognize when we start to take seriously the previous slide of Ignacio's point was that only by occupying your imagination and your gray matter will you make synthetic discoveries. So if you're not having fun, then you're only using your conscious mind by way of incentives and other reasons, and you will plod along. To make truly brilliant um, observations, you have to be having fun, in my opinion. If not, Einstein never came up with relativity because someone told him to, right? Well, my recipe, if I had to, 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 to boil it down to, to, to four-letter acronyms, which is kind of the contemporary, um, uh, you know, notions, is first off, I should be one, there should be wonder. I should always be wondering about things. What is going on here? Why is this happening? Why is this? Why is that? You fly into, into this town, and what are the things you wonder? Why do the lakes all have white perimeters on them? Do the lakes being all over the landscape indicate that the groundwater is high? Does that high groundwater translate to the deep system? Is this a deep groundwater system or shallow groundwater system? Blah, 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 blah. You look out the window, wonder. If you find yourself ending a day where you hadn't wondered about five or 10 things, you should reflect again and say, not time for bed yet. I have to actually think about a few things and what, what was weird today. So I think you have to wonder and be dazzled by the amazing organization of the earth because that really provides plenty of, of grist for your wonder. Then the second thing is, can you explain it? There's plenty of things I have no clue. You know, I, I don't know, uh, you know uh, much about vegetation and things like that. I don't, you know, sorry. The little perimeters on the lakes, maybe I can think about. So maybe one out of 10 things are actually 
things which I could actually understand in some fundamental way. Most, 9 out of 10, yeah, it's hopeless. Okay. Now, the question also then is, does it really matter? And I don't know, uh, you know, uh, th yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but there's lots of things I'm fascinated by which couldn't make a difference if it had been happening. And so, uh, anyway, making a better infiltrometer, it turns out there's about 10 people in the world interested. And I, you know, I say, okay, but so, um, so you really do have to assess if it matters. And, and it, we, life is short, and our situation now is precarious. And so we cannot afford simply to follow everything. We should be following the opportunities which potentially could make a difference. And then, um, could I check? So the point is, is there potential for scientific advancement? If you can't make a, a, a fundamental contribution that you could actually verify, then you you're not making a scientific contribution. So you put this all through, and what you see is that you, out of a thousand wonderments, you have one possible you know, opportunity. So the math hurts. I mean, you, you know, you got to respect the fact you have to be sitting there thinking all the time. And I think that's a fundamental thing that maybe we don't practice enough. And I'll interject here that I think it's overemphasized how smart people are. I think there's a lot of people who think, oh boy, so and so is really smart. I don't think that's it. I think these are trained processes. We force ourselves early on, and then it becomes a habit. And these are habits that do not require exceptional intelligence. They're habits that require discipline. Okay, so let's get into a few of these kind of, uh, of, of these whomps, if you will. I was sitting in a thesis exam, and, and this guy is talking about interception. And he was talking about all the different ways that interception occurs when plants, you know, intercept rainfall. And it all of a sudden hit me like a ton of bricks. Holy mackerel. I bet that 25% of the, of the water that falls in Oregon never hits the ground. First time, I, you know, there you are, you know, you, you haven't thought enough, you, you're sitting there and all of a sudden it kind of hits you. So how could we measure that? How could we, you know, is this, is this known? And I looked at the way he was trying to document this with rain gauges scattered hither and yon. It was, it was, you know, very messy, very complicated, very expensive, and not very accurate. Does it matter? I think so, yes. And I think that here in Canada, perhaps, is the, is the case study with the pine beetle. When that pine beetle wipes out the forest and you get a replacement stand, you don't know if the replacement stand is going to change the interception by a factor of two. Different, you know, the, certainly the cedar species versus the pine species, it's a factor of two to three, the interception. So these are big numbers. These are really big numbers. And is there potential to advance? I think there is. So I was sitting in this guy's thesis defense, and my feeling was, look, the tree is a giant spring. And I'm just going to take the stem of this tree and look at it compress and, and uncompress, and I'm going to calibrate it by hanging a bunch of weights on it. So here I've shown on the far screen a tree instrumented up with a compression meter. Yeah, yeah. Um, with a compression, a compression system, which are quartz rods, which are, anyway, lots of reasons, and it can, we can detect down to 10 nanometers of compression. We have four of them around it, so we can account for wind effects and all that stuff. Calibrate the tree by putting known weights on it. And then we can sit there and watch the tree dynamically as it intercepts snow, rainfall, whatever. Here's our calibration experiment um, showing displacements in microns. Uh, and you can see when we put on 40 kilograms and then we put back to zero and then 20 kilograms back to zero, et cetera, and then slowly ramps it up. So we can see, accurately detect five kilograms change in mass of this tree, which is pretty fun. And then you can go uh, to Africa, instrument the tree, and look at it during a storm event and see it get loaded up with rain, with, 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 with mass, and then it slowly evaporate off. Now this is also, the thing that motivated us partly in this case was satellite data. The satellites were showing diurnal variations in soil moisture, which we didn't believe. And uh, we think that they are due to this um, holding of water in the trees themselves. So this was a, so it was kind of fun, you know, we made this little compression thing, it's actually being reproduced and they're making a center, someone's designing a center to, to actually continue this set of studies. Um, but that was kind of, tough. I mean, I, 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 we were the first people, as far as we know, to import heating blankets into Africa. We had to heat the tree dynamically to keep it at constant temperature. So then we said, well, gee, is there a better way? And we were going to a, a geophysicist, John Lane, who brought this incredible accelerometer, so delicate that you set it on the earth and you can just, it will watch, it'll show you the vibrations of the earth and the resonant frequencies. And you can see the resonant frequencies of the surface of the earth. Wow, this is really great. What else can we do with this? What if we nailed it to a tree? Does a tree have a characteristic resonant, resonant frequency? If it does, 
which it does, 0.3 hertz, mostly. If it does, then if it rains or snows and changes the mass and the spring constant is the same, then what do you have? A different frequency. Ah, that's really easy. Just take your iPhone, nail it to a tree, take data, and then you can just analyze the accelerometer, and this is what you get. This is a leaf out of a tree, and the blue line is before leaf out, and the purple line is after leaf out. It pushed the whole spectrum of, of, of oscillation to the left. And we could, from that, by putting in a, a calibration mass and watching the effect of the calibration mass on, on oscillation, we can calibrate it. We can get the, the mass of leaf out in this tree. And of course, we can see the, the mass of rainfall or interception as well. And now, instead of having to instrument this whole thing with compression things, we can just nail a little accelerometer on it. OK, so, so the key point here is that you, know, you take an idea, you take a need, you, you visualize a response to it, you do something tough, and then you go to these mass-produced contemporary sensors and realize that accelerometers are everywhere now, highly sensitive, extremely inexpensive, and data logging and blah, 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 and now all of a sudden it's an $89 process of nailing a little data logging accelerometer to the tree. So I think there's some tremendous uh, opportunities there. Rain on snow, I guess here as in Oregon, is an important mechanism for flood generation. And so I wondered, it's a natural thing, you're, you're sitting there you know, downhill from your house, the whole valley's flooded. You say, what the heck happened here? And so um, the standard thing that comes to your mind initially is, oh, it rained a lot, that melt the snow. But then you, do the, you look at the latent heat of melting, and you look at the amount of uh, uh, the, heat to uh, the, you know, the heat cooling of water, it doesn't add up. And so, it, so actually the rain per se does not melt the snow. And you probably already knew that. Then the question is, what does melt the snow when there's a big rain on snow event? Because indeed, the snow does melt. Typically, when we have a flood based on rain on snow, we have what we call a Chinook. Now, I'm not sure what you call it here. We call it a Chinook so system, where the air temperature is approximately 10 degrees C, and it's raining hard. Therefore, the air is completely saturated with, uh, with water vapor, and it's usually very windy. And I wondered, what is going on with this? Do people really understand the melt mechanism? And I didn't know, so I started looking into it. Interestingly, all of the models I could find for snow melt are based on cold snow, minus 10, minus 20 degrees snow. They didn't deal well with the zero degree snow, particularly in this extreme case. So my feeling is that, the w that they have it half right. The current model is that it's a turbulent energy exchange just as you have for evaporation, it's the Kolmogorov kind of scaling model for turbulent eddy diffusivity. And if you look at this, then you'll find that the, latent and, uh, the sum of latent and uh, sensible heat go linearly with wind speed. Okay? That's the, the classic result from Kolmogorov uh, uh, similarity theory that Broussard and Marx et al. have used. The interesting thing is that the, mom that the, the kinetic energy of air parcels goes with the velocity squared. So it turns out that the pressure that develops when an a air parcel impacts the surface and changes its kinetic energy into potential energy goes with the square of the wind speed. So is there a chance then that this air being pushed into the snow by this mechanism that goes with the square of velocity, what would that do? It turns out if you take 10 degree air that's saturated in relative humidity, you push it into the snow, then what you get is a delivery of a lot of condensing water. And that, we're talking about a process wherein the energy delivered is of the order of it what it takes to melt snow. And so if you do the calculations, I find that approximately 3.5 meters per second is the threshold at which this term is equivalent to the, the other exchange process. So you have to have fast winds, you know, high winds, above 3 meters per second, and then you'll start to get this uh, transfer process, which I think requires warm, absolutely saturated air, which is often associated with these things. So we started to look at how we could, um, so yeah, the 3.2 meters per second is the key point. Okay, so I think we could put this together and it could be an important uh, uh, contribution. And so how do we check this work? What's the potential to actually check this? So what I needed was a tracer to see how the, the air would go in and out of the snow. And so let's look at all the tracers. It turns out that we, we had a blood on the snow incident where we, we put in a tracer, we had to, had to withdraw and inject it into these little bottles since we're injecting and withdrawing, injecting and withdrawing. This is a, a standard method. You put in a, a tracer that you pull out. 
and we had someone stick their finger. So, okay. So I wanted to look for a tracer that was non that was non buoyant. It had to not go up or down in the snow. It had to be non soluble. Wouldn't go into the water solution. Had to be um, you know non uh, low background concentrations. And basically, what it comes out to is carbon monoxide. Your friend. And the deal is that carbon monoxide, since it has one carbon and one oxygen, is the same density as nitrogen, which is the bulk of the atmosphere. So in fact, carbon monoxide is essentially neutral buoyant. It's very low background concentration. It's very low water solubility. It's highly available. You can buy it in canisters. You can safely handle it, although that is not, you know, you have to be careful. And the cool thing is these sensors are sensitive over five orders of magnitude in concentration. And these little tiny sensors, they are ti they're small, a few millimeters in dimension. They take very, very low power, and they're inexpensive because of the same kind of, you know, nexus of sensing technology that's coming together globally. And so using these, we made these poles that we could stick into the snow with these sensors and injection ports and all the, the tubing you can see to do all the injection and, and sampling and measuring pressures. And indeed, uh, we went to the glaciers and installed them and we very well could match the observed breakthrough curves with the uh, modeled breakthrough curves with advection in the snow. So this is our first step. We just published this paper last year. Or, um, it was oh, that was submitted to Glaciology 2007. It finally got, uh, got accepted here recently. Um, and it's, uh, it, you know, it's our first step in, in understanding these snow systems. I think we're, we're moving towards that. It, it does take time. The gla yeah. Another thing that Jeff and I wonder a lot about is where do streams come from? So you, you, you know, if you stand in a stream this time of year, uh, where did that water come from? Well, by and large, it came from the groundwater system, right? Because it, we're not getting a lot of net runoff with, the, with summer storms. I'm sure you have them uh, if, it's, if it's a storm system here. But by and large, in the summer months, much of our runoff is groundwater flow. And the question is, where does it come from? What are the relative relaxation times for each of those con contributions to the stream? How the stream is this amalgam of all sorts of groundwater upflow. How do those individual systems behave? Are they similar? Are they different? Is there a unifying concept like Broussard says there is? The 45-day time constant? God's word in, 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 uh, in, you know, in, in, in how the, the world responds? So we needed to look across scales in a river and be able to identify where the groundwaters were coming in and the flux of groundwater, which right now we didn't have the ability to do. And so that led to the big opportunity, which was how do we take temperature using light? And this is the fiber optic temperature measurement system. And basically what you do is you shoot in some light at a particular color, and the light that bounces back comes in two different flavors. One flavor is highly influenced by the temperature of the fiber, and one not. So the photons go down, they bounce back. We say, hey, when did that photon come back? That tells us how far away it came from. And what flavor was it? That tells us what the temperature was. So now what we can do, and honestly, the instrumentation is not my responsibility. There's companies that make this now. What we can do then is get the temperature to a hundredth of a degree C on centimeter scales, but over, s over spans of up to 10 kilometers. So we can start to cross the critical scales of variability in, s in, in hydrologic systems. So we don't, you know, so, th so that is, when people talk about scaling, that's what we need, right? We need to go from centimeter scale to kilometer scale. So the cool thing is that this technology is not too expensive. It's on the order of, say, $50,000-ish. And by the way, you too can get it free. We run a center which supplies this equipment. We're supplying it in Canada too where the National Science Foundation in the U.S. is given, we bought it on their dollar, and we send out technicians, we give training courses, et cetera, so contact me if you want to use this stuff. But anyway, it's not too expensive to buy. Through our program, it's extremely inexpensive. It's on the order of two hundredths of a degree precision. We can go on the order of 25 kilometers. We can have spatial resolution down to about 25 centimeters, temporal resolution to about one second, and we can t therefore take tens of thousands of measurements across those important spatial scales. So how are we going to use this in a river? Well, the first thing is to recruit some helpers. So on the right, you see my son and daughter who are, who are following Nick Van de Giesen and I as we carry this cable down, the, down the into the stream. And we lay this cable into the stream. It's a very fine cable. 
And what do we look, what do we see when we put this cable in? What it gives us is a temperature in, s in space. So here we have the upper trace is during the day, and we're coming, it starts, the upstream is towards me, the downstream is away, and so it starts off at 16 degrees, and then boom, it goes down to about 12 degrees at meter mark 107 and a half. Okay, what caused that? Well, it was a groundwater up upwelling. Cold water came in and cooled the river down. So interestingly, if you go there at night, in fact, it goes from seven and a half degrees up to eight and a half degrees. And so what we have then is, ah, yeah, the groundwater is warmer than eight, we can say, right? And it's, so we can kind of bracket the temperature. But in fact, we have how many unknowns? We have the temperature of the groundwater and the flux of the groundwater. And we have the temperature of the surface water and the flux of the surface water. We measure the temperature of the surface water and the incoming flow. And therefore, we only have two unknowns. Well, we have two equations for the, the energy balance here and two unknowns. We can solve for both the temperature and the flow of groundwater to the system at each of these places. And so that's what you see here, is a map of this stream in time vertically. So those are days when it gets warmer and colder, warmer and colder, that's day and night. And going down in space, you can see each of the major groundwater inflows. At each of those inflows, we therefore can calculate the, the, the inflow um, at that particular spring, if you will. Many of these springs were not known before we, we actually took these data. So it gives us a way to see a river in a whole new light. We can also then use that rich data set to understand this river not just qualitatively, but highly quantitatively. What if we do the overall energy balance of that entire river? So every energetic component, then perhaps with that really high quality validation data, we could model that river. And that's what we've done here. We've actually modeled uh, the Boiron River in Switzerland. And uh, the top are the actual observed temperatures. The bottom are the simulated temperatures. And those are four different locations down the stream uh, where the model and the, and the, uh, and the data are compared. And it's just striking that it's quite feasible to get extremely good match. That's because the thermodynamics are fairly well constrained. We have a you know, simple energy balance. But what does this allow? It allows us to ask what if questions what if instead of this stream here, which in fact was largely open, had been planted all in forests? <coughs> and we can see that the temperature in the forested case, the peak temperatures went from 16 degrees to below 14, knocking two degrees C off of the peak temperatures. In this particular river, there was a fish which was endangered that came out of Lake Geneva that generally would die right at about 17 degrees. So could we prepare for global climate change using this sort of model? I think so. And this way, we, by having a rich data set by which to validate it, we have much more confidence. And I think that going to the decision makers with this sort of uh, uh, valid data and valid modeling, they can then uh, make valid decisions about how to manage the landscape. So if we have to reveal at all, you know, hydrologists, it's quite embarrassing, quite frankly. We don't know where the water is in the landscape. We don't like to admit that in public, but uh, among friends here. Um, we don't really know. We, we think that, yeah, the water falls, and then it goes into the soil. And then Jeff's group and our group, and we can sit there and talk for hours about exactly where this water really went. Wouldn't it be cool if we could actually measure it? If we actually see at the multi-scale landscape level where the water went? Where is it sitting in the soil? How did it get there? So let's take a look at that same um, that same DTS, that same distributed sensing system, the fiber optic system. And if we took the cable and were able to inject some energy into it, heat it up, what would constrain how much it heated up? What would dictate how much it heated up? Would it perhaps be the thermal conductivity of the media it was sitting in? How quickly it dissipates the energy? Would it also be the thermal heat capacity of the media? how much energy it takes to heat it up. Both of those parameters are linked in the exact same way to moisture content. Water content increases conductivity and heat capacity. So what if we tried to then heat this cable electrically and watch the response to it? And so what we're, you know, this is a not a particularly like brand new idea. Heat pulse probes have been made at the kind of centimeter scale for, for generations. But what we're going to do is make a heat pulse probe that's a kilometer long. And we're going to see, can we thereby see the structure of water disposition in the environment? 
So first you have to go to the lab and uh, do the, 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 the hard work of calibration of this approach. So there's Chris uh, Gregory and, and Chadi Sedi uh, working on this, and, and uh, Chadi is still working on this as a postdoc in my lab and doing incredible stuff. The bottom line is that the answer is yes. Let's look at the lower graph here. Here we're looking at a, a 10 watt per meter injection of energy over four minutes. The lower dark blue dots are a saturated system, satur water saturated, and the upper dots were a dry system. And you can see the response of temperature in the vertical axis. It's I a factor of two plus difference in temperature. So we, ha we have sensitivity to water content. And therefore, what we did is we said, well, you know, rather, we're just gonna go directly for the goods. We're gonna skip all the intermediate steps. We're simply gonna integrate the area under that curve and say that that's related to water content. So we simply plot the integral under that curve against the, the measured water content and we see an extremely tight relationship. And so now we have a calibration curve for a measured response and water content at each location on the fiber. So go rent a bulldozer, go out to the field. Let's drop some cables in the field. We're putting in here three different cables, one at 30, 60, and one at 90 centimeters depth. And uh, we have the heating cable out there, the red one that's gonna provide energy to the end of the cable. And this was our first heat pulse. <coughs> so we have distance on the, on the axis coming towards you, time coming towards me, and delta T, the change in temperature um, in the vertical. And just focusing for the moment at the, at the mountain range, the peaks of the mountain range, you immediately see that those peaks have a lot of texture. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of variability in this field. And that was not a surprise. The farmer was growing corn, and his irrigation system projected into the corn. So it would, uh, it, it basically, below each emitter, you'd get a, a column of infiltration. And here we have the data looking at the 30 and 60 centimeters depth, and the different lines are three hours, nine hours, and 15 hours after the, the irrigation event. And you can see that, the, uh, that there's these, these kind of pistons of flow down through the system, um, and they're they are highly correlated between 30 and 60 centimeters. So what we have here is in one pass, in this site, it was only 250 meters long. If we're taking data every 25 centimeters, that's going to be uh, four times, it's 1,000 measurements of water content simultaneously, which really starts to speak to the structure of water content in this field. Now, you can get flux from this by doing a, a, a mass balance of the water. The water, you know, that it got to this depth, therefore there must be this much change in water content, and you could do a mass balance that way. But there's another thing, we want to go more directly for flux. We'd like to have a method to measure flux using the same temperature approach. How might we do that? Well, just like the high water content would quickly dissipate an injected pulse of heat, what if you tried to consistently heat it up for a long time? Well, then, you know, eventually the soil would heat up, unless there was flowing water, in which case it will advect away that heat, right? And so what if we could measure the actual amount of recharge and moving water at thousands of points. And could we do that by watching this change in temperature locally? So here we went to a wetland that was constructed just to leak. This was to recharge an aquifer that would then flow to a river that was in critical condition with respect to low flow. So we put our fiber optics in two horseshoe layouts. Um, <coughs> and we could then watch the infiltration in those. Um, here's our, our, our little plow that puts in four cables, actually. The blue one is the heated cable. And um, here is the concept. That is, on the right here, the blue plots show these different responses. These are actual responses from our data of the temperature change on different segments of the cable. And what you'll see is that some of them went to 23 degrees C, and many of them were only going to 20 degrees. So there's a difference in total change in temperature, and that's due to the flow. And you have to do long, this is a one hour pulse. And the equation at the bottom gives you velocity as a function of delta t. You can see delta t right in there. So simple equation, but it does work. So we're looking at that change in temperature after a long pulse. And what do you get? You get this picture of infiltration with distance along the fiber. And you can see that at 10 meters distance along one of these uh, sections, there was a fairly significant increase in recharge. But the axis on the vertical only goes from 20 to 50. We're normally thinking 
that you know, hydraulic conductivity follows a log normal distribution. So we were actually expecting some really nasty preferential flow. Well, as in fact, all the flow on average was 30 centimeters per day with a maximum, maximum, maximum of 50, not even a factor of two greater. That was really great news from a water treatment point of view, that this water was going to be resident in the soil system long enough to achieve the treatment that had been expected. So uh, clearly, uh, like the distribution of soil water, the distribution of flux of soil water is equally poorly understood. And this, I think, gives us a handle to, uh, to perhaps uh, attack that problem. Well, I'm going to give, this is a, a, a WOMP 5B, because this was WOMP 5, was it, because this data is so fresh that we literally worked it up last week. And so it's, it's, I, I, I just said, this is, you know, could you do the same thing in the air that you did in the soil? So we, we heated the water, we heat a wire in the air, and there's what's called the hot wire anemometer. That's the way you measure wind speed. You heat a little wire, and you see how much, how much energy it takes to make a certain temperature change. In this case, we're going to take a cable and lace it across a valley and heat the cable and see if we can see the local wind speed based on the temperature of the cable. So here's our setup. It's, uh, again, Chadi Sedek and, um, and uh, Christoph Thomas. Goes across a 250-meter transect, has three different elevations. At each elevation, we have three cables, three fiber optics. We can be able to get ref a heated cable and two references. Uh, and so we have uh, nine actual transects of, of, of fiber optics here. And then we uh, associated that with a bunch of uh, 3D sonic anemometers and other instrumentation to be able to check our data. And what you see in the upper left is the correlation between our DTS measured wind speed and the sonics, which is a very, it's a one-to-one -one correlation um, at both the half meter and the two meter elevations. We had uh, data from both. And then lower is a time series um, of those data. And it's just striking that at a single point, our DTS is working. But the cool thing is that we've got 750 meters times eight measurements per meter. So we have on the order of 5,600 measurements, unlike the two points that you got with the sonic anemometer. What's that allow? We can start to see the temperature field, of course, which is pretty cool. But this lower data is the wind field. And so we, were at we could see the wind coming over the cusp of that uh, valley, tumbling down over our system, and creating these really cool structures. Whereas this is the distance along the fiber, and this is time. And we'd see these characteristic regions where there was a, a, a turbulent transfer um, happening on, you know, a certain distance from the cusp of the, of, the, of the site. And of course, there were times when there was less wind and more wind. But we have now a full spatial representation of wind in space, which um, has hitherto been very challenging, and particularly getting it at sort of the sub, well sub-meter uh, spatial resolution. There's, how, okay, how many of you guys know what Darcy's Law is? Show of hands. Okay, good, good, good. And is the saturated conductivity bigger than the unsaturated conductivity? Yes or no? Yeah, okay, good. Wrong answer. When things get wet, they swell up. And we know that the Puiset equation says that the flow rate through an aperture, particularly a cylindrical aperture, goes with the fourth power of the aperture. Whew. So that means that if you double it, it goes up by a factor of 16. So if you're a swelling soil, and gosh, doesn't everything swell a little bit when it gets wet? Why are there clods, after all, besides the fact that things swelled and made them, right? So if you're a swelling soil and you're dry, then when the water comes down and you're going to have primary transport through the fissures, those, while they're open, are tremendously influential. So in fact, a dry soil might be more conductive than a wet soil. So this is great theory, but how many of you can measure the di dimensions of a crack? There were no crackometers out there. And this is highly frustrating for us. And so could we measure this, and could we see the implications of these processes in the real world? So we tried a lot of things. And you should see our shop. You know, there, were, there, were, there were disasters everywhere. Uh, we were making things out of foam rubber. We were making things out of bent steel. And finally, my student, uh, Ryan Stewart, his dad was a doctor. And so he had access to a lot of intravenous feeding bags. So what we ended up doing is we'd stuff an intravenous feeding bag into a crack, fill it with water, stick it into a standpipe, and then put a pressure sensor in the bottom. 
so that when the crack closed, it would eject the water and it would make a standing uh, column of water. We could measure the dynamics of that column of water. Very simple. One of the things you'll notice is that, um, that simple is good. Uh, we tried a lot of stuff. We had noisemakers, we had clickers, we had, God, everything. Um, and this is what happens. And so this is a 30-day experiment here. And one of the cool things is that we measured the, 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 the uh, crack width using a photometric method, and we measured the displaced volume using the bag, and they corresponded very well. Um, but uh, you need, y it's, it's, it's interesting, this time scale, the 15-day time scale. Swelling means that things have to diffuse into the block of soil, and sometimes that can be very slow. So this is a, a process which really could be important with respect to floods in you know, the timing of these things. And if you go to the field, what you'll see is that the crackometers, and we're just going to pay attention to, this to the red line and the, and the purplish line down below, those are the crackometer displacements. And what you see is that in the early time, there were these blue bars of, of, of we're putting on irrigation. The green is the runoff. And we didn't have any green until the, the fourth and final irrigation event. And that was finally when you can see the blue crack was, was the crackometer had fully closed. And the, the red crackometer was mostly closed. So only when these cracks had closed did we get significant runoff. So we're not a big surprise. But it's awfully nice to be able to actually measure some of these things instead of it just being a theory. And so, uh, again, was this some sort of fancy-dancy tool? No, it's a, it's a piece of PVC pipe and an IV bag. So it's, we're not trying to say that, generally speaking, making novel uh, hydrologic measurements requires you going out and spending tens of thousands of dollars. It really requires you to do one thing, and that is say, I will do this. I will do this. We will succeed. We will make that measurement. And that will is really, in this day and age, with the number of sensors and opportunities we have, is really the primary ingredient. We also then wanted to understand those shrinking swell soils, and, we need, and of course we're very cheap, and so we wanted an inexpensive way to look at the time-dependent shrinkage of these things. And in the, there's lots of ways that have been done in the past. They were all problematical. You submerge them in water, and you get them wet, and things like that. It turns out, if you use a golf ball as a reference, and you have your clod up top, you simply spin the thing around and take lots of pictures. And there's this program called Photosynth that will reconstruct a three-dimensional representation of what you've taken the pictures of automatically. And then you can simply fit a surface to it, and you have the volume. And we're able to, therefore, use the golf ball as a reference, calculate the vol volume of our, of our clods, and then get the whole shrinkage ratio in time and in, 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 in water content. So it turns out it's a very simple experiment. You simply put the clod on a turntable and let it rip. Start taking pictures and have the whole thing on a balance, and you get the whole shrinkage curve uh, without much muss or fuss. And the camera's $100, and the photosynth is free. So um, again, it's really more about the will to get something than it being some sort of fancy uh, trick. So what's the next big wump? The next big wump, I claim, is Africa. We need to prepare for the African century. Why do I say that? Look at China. There's China. There's Africa. More or less in the same scale representation. The dark blue, in both cases, represents over a meter of rainfall a year. Fundamentally, the amount of rainfall that falls on China is slightly more than that which falls on Madagascar. The rest of Africa is a gimme. How big is Africa? Well, lo down below we've got China, North America, or the United States at least, excuse me, United States, uh, Western Europe, India, um, all within the African footprint. Okay, it is gigantic. The population density is quite low. Well, if you're looking for food for this century, where are you going to find it? This is the largest unexploited water source in the current world. And it won't remain that way. This could be very good news for Africa. The drama is palpable that we know we're sitting on the biggest source of water that the world will ever see. And yet, in that critical band of Africa, where all the rain falls, there are of the order of 10 to 20 reporting weather stations to the WMF. 
Is that acceptable? Is that intelligible in this day and age when Africa is covered with cell phones? When everything is self-reporting? When a weather station costs a few hundred dollars? Isn't it incredible? And yet, year to year, we persist in this situation. Well, the TOMO, the Trans-African Hydrometeorologic Observatory, intends to install 20,000 stations by 2025. And we have stations now operating in about eight countries. And our goal for this coming two-year period is to get East Africa um, instrumented uh, with several hundred stations. Um, and we're simply leveraging the low-cost technology, the cell phones everywhere, and the low energy consumption of this new technology. It turns out with a solar cell the size of a pack of gum, you can power this entire operation, the cell phone, all the sensors. And you get out continuous data streams. We're marrying this to schools. So you see Zach there on top of a Kenyan school because we're creating sister schools between Western and African uh, schools so that kids can develop relationships and they can look at each other's climate and have a common point of, of reference to talk about. So we're having a sister school program as part of this. Um, and fundamentally, we plan on transforming our understanding of this continent before the climate changes too drastically. We need to know what's going on there now and which way it's going for the future. So we're all following in the footsteps of giants. This uh, talk was inspired by uh, Galen Campbell, who is one of the, the finest uh, instrument developers in the world. And um, if you have a chance to meet Galen, do it. What you'll see is a guy who listens with absolute humility. He always knows that he has something to learn. He always knows that people have had experiences which he has not. So listen to with humility. Think. That's the thing we control. We don't control Afghanistan. We don't control our own country, for that matter. What we do control is what's on our shoulder. So learn to think. Learn to use what you've got. Reality matters. Data matters. Take it seriously. That's the advancement of science. Strategy. Excitement is great, but you have to have a strategy. You have to know why, you th why something's exciting. It can't just be exciting because you're a cyclist and you want a better speedometer. That's not going to do it. It has to be something fundamental. Be discriminating. You have very few hours on this planet, and you have to use them wisely. Teamwork. Just like the first one, listening with humility, you can't possibly get things done yourself that you could with a team. The diversity of, uh, of, you just avoid falling off of the stage, if you will. You avoid the pitfalls of life by having more eyes on the problem. Work as a team. Keep it simple. If it can be done with a, bag, a plastic bag and a, and a piece of plastic pipe, do it that way. And kind words matter. Uplift people. Uplift yourself. Take care of the fact that you're a human being and that it's a delicate matter of being sane. So, uh, you know, so these are the, these are the, if I had to boil it down, uh, following really on, on the mentors who I, I respect the most. How do you get to these wumps? I say be open and joyful. Be humble because you always have to, you know that you, you're, you're not there yet and then there's good reasons for that. Recognize there are questions that need answers. Look for opportunity. <coughs> believe that there are opportunities. If anyone says to you that, that we have, we're pretty much there, laugh. No, don't, that's not nice. That's not joyful. That's, but you want, but sort of, anyway, but no, you, you just have to keep in your mind that no, we actually have an opportunity and to, to do some things that have not been envisioned before. One in a thousand ideas are worth following up you know, on. So that number one means you have to have a lot of ideas. So practice that. Okay, just do it every day. And then be very discriminating in what you pursue. Don't let a fun idea that really could, couldn't matter less take over your life. It happens to too many really good people. So I say good science rests on excitement. It rests on passion. And it comes out of joy. So it is a human experience. So good science is not all about a hypothesis. I find it's about the human experience and kind of relishing it. And with that, I'd love to take any questions.
All right, thank you very much, Sean. That was, that was great. Interesting reflecting on the, um, the gauging density of uh, that part of Africa. It's probably still greater than Canada <laughs> overall. No, actually, uh, <laughs> in Canada here, by the way, uh, Earth Networks has a, a network of 650 stations that I know of uh -huh. in this area. Okay. So there's a lot of data. It may not be that you know of it, but th it is there. Huh. Yeah, Good. there's a lot of data here in Canada. All right, so as promised at the Journal Club at noon, I was going to call on some of the students to kick off the questioning. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. John, perhaps you could repeat the question for those that are uh, you bet. watching in. So are you interested in the flux in the groundwater or the river flow? Okay, okay, good. Um, so what we're talking, so the question is a, a little more detail about how this whole flow, flow sit monitoring system works. So what we have on the left-hand panel here, you'll see there are, are four cables, two, three white and one blue. The, the white ones just have fiber optics that could passively measure temperature very accurately. The blue one, we're going to run electricity down its jacket. That's why it's bigger. And we're going to heat it. Now, if I inject energy in that cable, where could that energy go? It can be conducted out. It can diffuse out, if you will. But it can't just be destroyed willy-nilly. So if there's no movement of water in the system, then eventually, the, because diffusion of energy goes to the square root of time, it will reach an asymptote in a certain characteristic manner. It will come out in a square root of time sort of, of curve. However, if there were flow, then, after, then uh, what you'll get to is a steady state temperature because you're basically moving away the heat at the same rate ultimately you're putting it in. So there's a fundamental different uh, curve. There's a diffusion curve of heat and there's a steady state flux curve of heat. So one of them levels off and one of them keeps on going up. So by looking at the difference in the temperature that is achieved by that cable, we can see if it's flowing, if it's flowing very quickly, quickly enough, and all you'll see will be the temperature of the background water. As you go slower and slower, then you'll get more and more temperature change because you're, you're wiping away the heat more slowly. So basically all we're saying is that we can get the, um, the flow rate as a function of the ultimate temperature that that cable achieves. If the temperature achieves, see how this flattens off? That's a high flow area. See how this kind of goes up with a curve? That's a diffusion curve. So you can really start to see the difference between a high flow area and a low flow area. And all we're doing is looking at that ultimate delta T, that change in temperature, as a function of time, and then putting it into a very simple thermodynamic model for heat flow in a, in a flowing system. Make sense? In this case, the cable was just about 20 centimeters below the surface, but um, you can put it anywhere. There are plows which can put these things down. As I say, we in other cases, we've gone approximately 90 centimeters is our deepest. Um, we have some in Oklahoma. We have three heated cables at, at 5, 10, and 25 centimeters, so looking at flux as a function of depth. Uh, but there's no fundamental uh, limitation besides practicality. Mm -hmm. We use a tractor and a plow as we go deeper. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Chris, then Graham. You had to give me a clue. The, oh, like the, oh, 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 Yeah, these guys. Ah, yeah, the slope is evection. Right. So this is the heat of the day going downstream. So this is distance, and that's time. And so that slope is, is, that is the advection downstream, yeah. And so one of the cool things you can do, and we don't show it here, is we threw in like coolers full of ice. And you see the advection of the ice downstream. And then we do this now in boreholes, where we actually put, um, I, I, I cannibalized a tea heater, you know, the water heater for tea? Took it apart and s put that onto a cable and put it down a well. We heated up the, that, that heater and then turned it off, and we could watch that, that the, the, the bulb of water advecting up and down in the well and get the local velocity of water in the well that way. 
So yeah, that advective velocity is a really cool trick to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Graham, and then over here. No, not that I know of. And we've talked about this for years. The, of course, the challenges have to do with installation. How do you get into frozen stuff? But I think that understanding the permafrost, understanding the dynamics of frozen soils, uh, gosh, you know, it, it, you, you, there's a pretty natural uh, fit there. I, well, I say no because I don't know of anybody doing it. If I had to wage money, I bet someone is now. But I think it's a great idea. Yeah, the permafrost application for DPS would be, would be very useful. So the question is, in the two-dimensional wind field approach, can we get the direction of the wind? It turns out that we're a little sensitive to the direction of the wind. Because if the wind is blowing down the fiber, it has a different cooling effect than going perpendicular to the fiber. Unfortunately, to this point, well, a few weeks into this analysis, um, we are seeing this more as a limitation than a benefit. However, um, one you know, may be able to eventually interpret it more. But I think fundamentally we're measuring one parameter. That's delta T, the change in temperature. And, and so we can only hope to get a wind speed in that approach. The vector wind, I think we could have crossing cables um, and start to try to get at some of these things. Because the apparent wind speed, if you had crossing cables, then you'd see that they had two different apparent wind speeds. And that way you could start to understand the component velocity at least but still, you would not get direction. So I would say that that's an outstanding challenge. Yeah. Well, uh, how high can you measure this wind field with this approach? And uh, there's, a, there's a guy, an Israeli guy. Uh, the Israelis, you know, they had to serve in the military. And so they learned to do different things. And one of them learned to fly helicopters. And so... Um, a, he wants to actually put a fiber down off a helicopter. We're going to go a couple of kilometers. So we want to do a whole profile of the atmosphere. Uh, so we think we can do a couple of kilometers vertically. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any fundamental limit. We've sent them up with balloons where you can take a balloon and, you know, send the fiber up. It's difficult to keep the balloon right above you. Uh, the balloons tend to move around. So we think that the helicopter with a, an active drone on the bottom to, to keep it below us, we think will be more successful. But that's, uh, that's our current plan. And you're, you're towing these behind ships at sea as well, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Ocean I temperature. Yeah, yeah well, the, the guys at Scripps University uh, want to understand the impact of rainfall in the ocean. And it's, you know, the cool thing is the ocean's salty, the rainfall's not. It floats, right, because it's lighter, lower density. It evaporates preferentially. It's also cooler often when it rains. So you develop a cold lens. And that, of course, cools the water below it, which creates, potentially, very large convective cells in the ocean. So all this has some implications. So what we did is we made a cable that floats, and they could drag it behind their ship as they steamed around Tahiti. Didn't invite me to do the steaming around <laughs> Tahiti part, but, um, but they, they, they dragged around behind their boat in Tahiti, and they could actually watch the local influence, the duration and magnitude of, of surface cooling due to rainfall. Uh, so yeah, and we, that was a demonstration at two kilometers, but you know, we can our goal is to probably go to 10 and more kilometers with that now. So it worked Great. out very well. One last question, Ali, and then we'll wrap up. Right, so the question is, how do we, this all was quite applicable to the smallish scale, but how do we get to the regional scale modeling and things like that? And I guess uh, philosophically, and it, it really could just be my perspective on the world, but 
my feeling is that our degree of understanding of the sub-kilometer scale processes <coughs> are some of the primary constraints on the quality of modeling at the higher scales. I think that we've been better at getting large-scale understanding of atmospheres, of land interfaces. It's easier to measure things at some of these larger scales. And we really, in my experience, have much less understanding of the small-scale processes. So I think that by getting these descriptions up to the kilometer scale, I consider that to span some of the fundamental uncertainties that we still have. Not to say there aren't more, but I think that were you here last week for Danny's talk, and you saw how even understanding the stoma, stomata at the micron scale and the, the scaling relationship between spacing and size of those stomatal openings at that micron scale had implications at the global scale. I think that the scales I'm talking about here are even perhaps more direct in their transferal to the large-scale modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, if you look at the soil water models used in global circulation models, they're pathetic. They're pathetic. They don't, ha and, and you know, it reflects on us. We're pathetic, I suppose, in giving them better models. So we really don't understand the structure of the variability of moisture content, and we therefore model it all as a uniform thing. I think it'd be much better to model and to upscale based on statistical distribution of water contents, and then we could properly upscale. When we know that distribution, we can upscale to the kilometer scale, and then honestly, once we're at the kilometer scale, I think that it's fairly, you know, fairly direct to upscale from there. That of course, that's probably my, my bias, but the point is that I do think that, we're, that these will address very important questions at for people doing the modeling at the larger scales. Uh, that's my belief. Uh, only time will tell, I suppose, but good question. Okay, well, I think, uh, you know, hydrology is a field, water resources is a measurement limited science. And, John, you've given us some, some great insights into new measurement uh, frontiers, and you've really been at the coalface of a lot of these uh, technologies. So, thanks so much for coming and giving us a great talk. So, thank you. <laughs> so, John will be around for the next uh, hour and a half or so. But we're going to migrate the discussion to Alexander's. Everyone is able or is, is uh, invited to join us, and I uh, hope to see you over there. Next week is Peter Trock from University of Arizona. For those that are uh, signing in or s coming in by, um, by uh, the simulcast, we might try to set up uh, an email next week where you can actually um, contribute questions. And for those of you who are, who are hearing from outside of um, Saskatoon, I'll try and uh, craft an email to the organizers at uh, the other university to try to facilitate that and perhaps Chris or Anna you could help me with that next week. They could text message them Peter. They could, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right, they'd have to be uh, a, sm a small question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That might even be better. <laughs> okay, see you all next week or later tonight.